We'd usually stop at midday each day and um, have a little bit of a meal. In our case, to begin with, this was packets of soup or something of that kind. But the porters would bring out a bag of tampa, which is barley flour, and you just mix that up with water and eat it in a sort of cold and soggy lump. It's an acquired taste, but we acquired it ourselves after a while. That and um, Tibetan tea, the traditional green tea with lumps of rancid butter floating around with it. The edge of the glacier, we find these incredible great blocks of stone perched on pillars of ice, a little thing like an enormous mushroom sticking up out of the ice. We had to walk for two days on the ice. We bivouacked one night at just under 17,000 foot on the glacier. But by about nine o'clock in the morning, the snow was getting very soft, and we were quite amazed at this stage to suddenly see a party of locals coming the other way, trying to drive two horses with them. Zanskar, the Zanskar Valley, just on the other side of the mountains, is famous for its horses. And these people had come over from the southern side of the mountains to buy a couple of horses and try to take them back. How they ever got them up the northern side of the pass, heaven only knows. They were really having a hard time of it at this stage. We found we were sinking thigh deep into the snow, and of course a horse's hoof just goes straight down. We were feeling really shattered, but our porters had incredible energy. They knew we had a frisbee with us, and they suddenly put down their loads and said they wanted to play with it. The Humarsila, the pass that we uh, crossed the Great Himalaya by, is getting on for 17,500. Again, moving very, very slowly at this height. Very hard work. Our porters, who, of course, were full of energy, even though they were carrying these enormous loads, had gone bounding on ahead of us and were up on the top of the pass waiting for us. When we got there, we were all presented with a little strip of cloth. We were also relieved of 10 rupees each, which is, I suppose, a rather newer tradition. <laughs> It's traditional when you're crossing a pass to make some sort of offering at the top. Sometimes you just add a stone to the can, or sometimes you tie a white scarf to something on the top. Looking down the far side of the pass, there's a very steep snow and ice slope, about a thousand foot leading down in, onto the glaciers on the other side. And amazingly, all the porters suddenly gave whoops of glee and sat down on their backsides and slid down. We sat down on our behinds and slid down too, which after eight days of toiling steadily uphill was really very, very nice indeed. Just below the snow line on the other side, you do get a certain amount of vegetation dependent on meltwater from the snow fields. The Himalayan blue poppy, wild rhubarb and all manner of alpine plants which um, you normally see in people's rock gardens back here. As you go on down the valley, the country becomes drier and drier. After five days without seeing any human habitation at all, we came to the first of the monasteries, Zonkul. This is a very holy place to Buddhists, because the great teacher, Naropa, spent a long time in meditation there. As we came out into the Zanskar Valley, we started to come across Marni walls. 
These are very important symbols of the Buddhist faith. The tops are covered with carved stones placed there by pilgrims. Usually they have mantras carved on them, most commonly Om Mani Padme Hum, but sometimes they have representations of gods or spirits instead. And there must be literally millions of these carved stones all over Ladakh and Tibet. Chortons were originally funeral monuments, but they've now become much more abstract symbols. Every mile or two, there were side streams coming down into the main river. Some of these were quite difficult to cross. The Zanskar River itself is far too deep and wide to ford. You have to go across on a bridge of some kind. After a total of 13 days walking, we arrived in the little village and monastery of Kasha. We made this our base for our work in the Zanskar Valley. We had a room in this house. The houses are made partly of stone and partly of mud bricks. Making these bricks is great fun. You, you start off by digging a hole, diverting a stream in it, and you make a sort of enormous mud pie. And you then pick mud out and pack it into a mould and to lift the mould off, leave the bricks dry in the sun. And these bricks are surprisingly durable. They, they last for very many years. The roofs of the houses have got firewood stacked on them. And there's also fodder for the animals on the roofs. The temperature gets down to about 40 below in midwinter. So there are virtually no bushes anywhere near the villages. The firewood often has to come from great distances. It may be carried on backs of yaks for as much as 50 miles. Agriculture is entirely dependent on meltwater from the glaciers thousands of feet above. There's virtually no rain at all. So what limits the amount of land you can cultivate is the amount of water you get coming out of the snow fields. The water's carefully led off in irrigation channels, and then down into the fields. The main crop is barley. About 90% of the cultivated land grazed barley. When we arrived in early August, the harvest had just started. They harvest it by just pulling it up by the roots. They don't cut, cut it, they just pull it out of the ground and then stack it in the fields upside down with the roots sticking up and the ears pointing downwards. I suppose this is to try and stop the birds eating too much of it while it's stacked there, but it's not entirely successful. They do get a share of it. Of course, every grain is precious. You don't leave any lying around on the ground. It really is a subsistence economy, this. The people are absolutely up against it. They do also grow peas. Not nearly so much as barley, but there are a few fields of peas. Here again, they're harvested just by pulling them up by the roots. They don't pick off the individual pods. They just roll the whole thing up, pull it out of the ground. And they're left dry in the fields for several days after they've been pulled up. There are very few animals around the villages. On pastures just below the snow, there'd be yaks and zoos, which is a hybrid between a yak and a cow, and sheep. 